So, uh, Professor Kay, uh, in your speech you said EU needs to do more. Mm -hmm. How can the EU governments take the burden of more motor spending after all this austerity? Well, I think uh, the EU doing more uh, in the very near term is not likely at all, uh, given the nature of the debt crisis. Uh, and I think that, as I said, uh, if you uh, actually follow the, the French right now, they're moving closer into NATO, not further towards the EU on defense capabilities. So uh, and the, the reason is because it helps them actually uh, economize uh, at this stage. Um, the EU uh, in, in the security capacity in the much longer term may be what emerges, but um, my priority would be a radical rebalancing within the NATO context. Uh, so uh, you don't necessarily duplicate, but you, but America would also stop a, an existing uh, kind of red line of saying no, uh, we don't want the EU capacity to be independent of the United States. So what I'm arguing is um, we need to declare a goal of helping Europe get to the point not breaking it so Europe goes on its own, but that the United States moves to the point where we say it's our goal to help you build that capacity. Uh, so it would be far better to see this as part of a plan and a stated goal over, say, five years as opposed to atrophying and just kind of eventually having to do it but when maybe it's too late and too costly and, and dangerous if, if uh, these institutions do, uh, in a worst case, begin to uh, either unravel or really reach a, 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 a serious moment of irrelevance. Uh, you said it's all about the budget at the end of the day, and given the deficit and the $12 trillion debt of the U.S., is, which is, is a matter of national security. How can this threaten U.S. primacy in global security? Yeah, it's even more than 12, I think it's about 14 or even more trillion dollars, uh, because the foundations of primacy are built upon your economic power. And, and uh, if America is um, uh, too overstretched on what it prioritizes in military spending, and especially overseas presence, which is the, one of the biggest highly cost, uh, high cost elements of our force posture, um, then we're eroding the economic foundations of our power. And we're not investing in the things that make you competitive for the 21st century. So this is actually an economic argument or a political economy argument, which is that uh, one has to be able to make hard choices about prioritizing. I'm not saying you get rid of everywhere in the world, obviously, but I think you do have to make a, sort of literally a list of, of priorities. And if you look at the nature of the world, it's very obvious that um, the major place for um, uh, allocation of resources is likely to be in the Asia uh, region. Um, and, and so if you're looking at the world in that context, you get to a, a, a Europe and you think, um, um, you know, 60 years after World War II, 20 years after the end of the Cold War, um, if we can't disengage from Europe, where in the world can we disengage from? And so it's kind of, as I've said, uh, low-hanging fruit for um, budget people. You know, so they, they just look at that and think, Sorry, but um, that line is going to get a zero. Um, and so that really becomes the driver of this. There are other factors, too. I think there's a, there's a weariness in the United States of uh, they're being tired of the wars that we've been in. And I, I think there is a growing um, sense of isolationism as well, that you know, people are just thinking you know, it's time to take care of the United States. You know, very high unemployment. Uh, people are hurting. And so when, when, when they're looking at the world and they see America spending a lot of resources in other places, it's kind of a natural instinct to say, um, you know, let's rebuild this country. Let's do some nation building at home, uh, in effect. Uh, now about Libya. Uh, things don't seem to have turned out quite as uh, the British and French and the Americans expected. What went wrong, and what's NATO's role after that? Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, let's hope it does go right. I, I, I wouldn't rule it out. I think there's a great reason to be hopeful that, um, you know, this could go well still, and that the transitional uh, government is able to consolidate um, authority. But, um, and, and so I, I would say that the mission to this point has gone well. But the problem with planning in NATO is that they, they, they often only can agree to do what they're going to do up to the point that they do it. And so if there's no consensus for what to do after we succeed, then you have a real risk of a vacuum, basically. And this is the danger in these kind of operations, is that you can win the war but lose the peace very quickly. And, and so Libya, 
you know, we're, we're sitting here on the uh, 7th of September, uh, within a matter of weeks is going to need uh, uh, provision of basic security services, electricity, hospitals, water. Who's going to run it? What's the plan? I mean, we're not talking about like in six months they might need that. They need that right now. And, and so um, unless there's a, a mobilization of resources, and the only organization that probably can do it right now is NATO, um, there is a real risk of a security vacuum. And there is also a, a real risk that these tribes that were united against one person, Gaddafi or one regime, um, start arguing with each other and it becomes very hard for them to govern. And, and they start arguing about who gets the, uh, the, the, the money that's going to be returned and who gets to control the oil and things like that. So, um, you know, how, so, so, so these situations can work. It worked in Bosnia. We sent 60,000 troops on the ground after a settlement, after the peace was achieved. And within six months, the military did rebuild through NATO um, uh, basic infrastructure capacity for the country. And that military mission was achieved in six months. And then the other organizations, the World Bank, the EU, the IMF, uh, were able to come into place. So there are models for these things. There's another model like um, when Albania collapsed, it was called Operation Alba, where Italy took the lead. And Italy co coordinated, I think, a dozen other countries outside of NATO. It was a coalition of the willing. But they went into Albania and they restored order in the country in the late 1990s. They helped it get stable and allowed them to rebuild after their, their society virtually had collapsed economically. So there are models for this. So it's not a question of do we have the capacity, it's is there going to be the will to make it happen. And all it takes in NATO is one country to say no, and then NATO's out of the question. Um, and all the countries in NATO now have said no ground forces for Libya. So you know, my challenge would be, well, if you started a war for clear, reasonable, moral purposes, then where is the morality of walking away from it or not following through to make sure that actually winning the war and winning the peace are one and the same?